Do we know which way we're headed? Markets don't believe the Fed. The U.S. isn't sure about paying all those bills that it's racked up. And earnings, well, earnings are just all over the place. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David West. This week's special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on a Fed sending mixed signals. I think the Fed's doing a good job of portraying substantial uncertainty in uh, the economy. And Rushir Sharma of Rockefeller International on whether India is finally coming into its own for investors. This is a country that has consistently disappointed the optimists and the pessimists. It was a week of contradictions. The Federal Reserve hiked rates another 25 basis points and warned that more is coming. We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. Whatever Chair Powell said, the markets apparently heard only that things may be getting better. I think there are opportunities for this rally to go longer and higher than you would expect. While the European Central Bank and the Bank of England continue to play catch up with both raising rates the expected 50 basis points we know that we have ground to cover we know that we are not done president biden met with speaker mccarthy at the white house and afterward they agreed only on continuing to talk with no resolution in sight of the debt ceiling dilemma my role right now is to make sure we have a sensible responsible ability to raise the debt ceiling, but not continue this runaway spending. Earnings were all over the place, with Snap selling off while Meta surprised to the upside. It is a good sign that both daily active users and monthly active users for a platform like Facebook that is, you know, quite, quite old in uh, social network terms is still gaining. Caterpillar missed on profits while GM scored big. Where we see um, consumer demand for our vehicles at our price points is, is really strong. We just need to make sure we get production uh, up to be able to meet that demand. But over in India, the Adani conglomerate had bigger problems than just earnings, as it tried to stabilize with a stock offer after being hit hard by a short seller, only to have to cancel the offering as the company lost over $100 billion in market value. It's all about debt. I mean, the, the company and its associates are heavily in debt, and that's what sort of scared us away. And then came Friday, with U.S. jobs numbers coming in far above what anyone had predicted, adding 517,000 new jobs to an already tight market, dropping the unemployment rate to 3.4 percent, which drove bond yields up, with the yield on the 10-year adding 13 basis points on Friday alone, but remaining nearly flat for the week overall, ending up at 3.52, while the S&P 500 climbed 1.6 percent over the week, and the Nasdaq gained a robust 3.3 percent. To take us through a very busy week in the markets, we welcome now Bob Michael. He's J.P. Morgan Asset Management Head of Global Fixed Income Currency and Commodities, and Aaron Brown, PIMCO Portfolio Manager for Multi-Asset Strategies. Welcome both of you for being back with us. Aaron, I'll start with you. This was a very busy week. Uh, the markets were not always clear about what they thought. What did you make of what happened over the course of the week, and particularly those jobs numbers? I think that the jobs numbers came well above consensus expectations and certainly underpin the fact that the economy is not in a recession right now, that job growth still remains quite strong and the labor market is still quite tight. And it probably also underscores the fact that the Fed has more work to do with respect to you know, keeping rates in restrictive territory. The Fed has already indicated that they're likely hike in at least an additional time, one time in March. And then after that, I think, you know, certainly there's scope for the Fed to potentially hike an additional one time or pause there. But in either case, the Fed will likely not cut rates for an extended period, continue to remain restrictive for quite some time, and then really observe and see how the, the data unfolds from there. And so while the market has been romancing this idea of the Federal Reserve starting to cut at the tail end of 2023, the Federal Reserve, at least for now, is likely to continue to keep rates on hold for an extended period of time and not meet the market's expectations for rate hikes as soon as the market is expecting. 
Bob? Yeah, David, I, I wasn't confused at all. Actually, for the first time, I think the Federal Reserve and the labor data confirmed what the average investor, the average consumer is seeing. The Federal Reserve could have walked in and said inflation is nowhere near our target. We've got to raise rates indefinitely and push Fed rates expectations much higher, maybe the terminal rate to five and a half, even five and three quarters percent. Instead, they came in and said what I see, which is inflation is moderating. We can see an end to rate hikes. They confirm that. You look at the jobs data, and yes, it was a very big number, but how many times have we been here and we've said, everywhere we go in the services economy, there's a shortage of worker. You look at airports, you look at restaurants, they're complaining about not being able to hire enough workers. And this confirmed that. This labor, for, this labor report confirmed that the economy has shifted consumption from work from home sort of expenditures to things that are more services, travel and leisure. So I understand that. We've all been to restaurants and there's nobody to wait on you and things like that. But can we keep up this pace, Bob? I mean, this is a torrid pace. 500,000 jobs a month. How long can we keep this up? Well, the data could have been very encouraging for the Fed because it shows they're meeting their dual mandate, right? Uh, strong economy, uh, full labor market, and inflation. You saw wages come down a little bit. The, the rate of wages is up 4.4 versus 4.8. But I think the market's right. I think the market's telling us you don't have 3.4% unemployment and wages stay stable. You're going to create wage pressure, which is going to create a lasting inflation problem. Aaron, what about that? Because that's one of the things that struck everybody, that you added so many jobs, got tighter and tighter in the labor market. At the same time, actually, the wages came down a little bit. Where is the wage pressure, and is it coming, and when? Well, I think part of it is a mix shift issue, and we know that average hourly earnings does have some distortions with respect to the mix shift. And so looking at ECI, Atlanta wage data, is probably more appropriate indicators. You know, that said, I do think that there is continued pressure, particularly on some of the services um, side, and particularly some of the areas that Bob mentioned with respect to leisure, travel, transportation, which saw some of the, you know, significant job gains this last month. Um, that said, you know, we are starting to see peak inflation on the wage side. We are starting to see measures of inflation start to move lower with respect to wage growth. And I think that that's likely to continue as we move through, you know, the course of 2023. We'll still see wage gains, but at a slower pace. And I think that's what the Fed is really keyed in on in terms of, you know, setting and determining their policy. If they continue to see wage growth move lower, um, which we're starting to see that will allow the Fed to eventually back off and, and really pause. And so I think that's what the key thing to watch is, is the pace of wage gains, which is slowing from here. So, so Aaron, I pick up on that very point, because uh, I think most people agree, certainly Jay Powell said, we're starting to see some disinflationary forces. We're starting to see some of the inflation come off. But there's a question about whether that's going to continue, as you suggested, or whether you're really going to be able to get it down to anything like 2 percent without a lot more increases on the Fed. So I, I don't think the Fed is likely to hike rates, you know, significantly higher than here. I think one additional 25 basis point hike or potentially two is probably the most that's in the cards for the Fed at this time. And then they're going to sit and wait. And, you know, we all know that Federal Reserve policy, you know, moves with variable and lagged effects. And so I still think that the Fed thinks that that the effects of the tightening last year will still continue to make their way through the economy uh, this year. And therefore, you know, there may not be future rate hikes that are necessary. But, uh, you know, I think that they're willing to to wait and see whether or not future rate hikes are, are necessary after another one or two hikes. And so, you know, I do think that the Fed right now, you know, does expect that they're, they're at least not there's not significantly more hikes that are necessary. And as a result of that, they're, you know, willing to take a little bit of a wait and see approach. You know, that said, um, you know, we have seen some disinflation. We'll likely see more. But to s expect that we're going to move, you know, close to 2 percent by year end, I don't think, you know, many are expecting that. And, you know, I think that at this point, the Fed will think of anything less than 3 percent 
uh, you know, in terms of core PCE, inflation is a win. So right. I think that's the number to be looking for, not 2%, it's really sub 3%. Bob, last, one last one to you on this subject, and that is, what do you expect the Fed to do? And number two, what are the bond markets anticipating? Those could be two different things. Well, we expect... I think the they are two different things. Oh, Sorry, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So I, I agree with Aaron. The, the Fed is setting us up to do one or two more rate hikes. And as she said, they pause, they wait for the cumulative and lag effects to hit. Our analysis shows that from the last rate hike until recession, it's roughly a year. So you're going to have to wait out several quarters to see, are you going to have that mythical soft landing or are you headed into recession? The market is starting to front run that. We've all done the work. We know at the time of the Fed's last rate hike, that's the peak in yields and things rally like crazy, particularly the front end of the yield curve. That's what we're seeing in bond markets. Absent today, we think that's what we're going to see going forward. Aaron, is that where you are? I think that's right. I do think that the Fed has, or I think the market rather has front run the Fed with respect to its expectations for rate cuts. And I think that the Fed, the market rather is likely to be disappointed um, with respect to how quickly the Fed actually cuts rates. I think that just given the fact that inflation is going to be persistently higher and stickier than what the market's anticipating, that we're not going to see the, the extent of rate cuts, uh, you know, happen as quickly as the market wants. And so I think the market's setting itself up for disappointment. And I, I do think ultimately, you know, the Federal Reserve will create a minor recession in the U.S. and that the that will take down equity markets and sort of higher risky um, asset classes. But I, I think in the interim, you know, between now and when there's, you know, a recession starts, you know, the markets can do okay. Um, and and the, it is, you know, a little bit of a rally everything environment. Mm -hmm. But once the recession hits, that's, you know, that's certainly good for fixed income, but is not going to be as good for equity. So in, mm -hmm. in that instance, I'd rather be a buyer of fixed income, which can rally as it, you know, we sort of romance disinflation and can also rally into a recession, whereas equities will only do well you know, in this disinflationary environment, right. but not do as well once the recession hits. Okay. Thank you so much, Aaron Brown of PIMCO and Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan. They're going to be staying with us as we turn to some of the other big issues out there for the markets. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. The market has disappointed the bulls, it has disappointed the bears. It has been, if anything, a cat on a hot tin economy. Those who believe against all the evidence that the market is always efficient, sophisticated, and prescient may have a little trouble explaining the last two weeks, when the market first soared in its best day in 10 months, and then two sessions later panicked for its worst day in five months. That, of course, is Louis Rickheiser on Wall Street Week back in February 1982 when the number one movie was On Golden Pond and the top song was Centerfold by the Jay Giles Band. I have to say, people have to remind me what that song was, but I remember it now. Aaron Brown of PIMCO and Bob Michael from J.P. Morgan are still with us. So let me start with you, Bob. We've talked about the central banks. We've talked about jobs. I don't know if we have a, a, a market on a hot tin economy. Isn't that what we just heard <laughs> from Louis Rickheiser? But apart from the center bank, uh, central bank and apart from the jobs numbers, what are the things that you're looking at there, at there right now that could affect investors? Well, I think that's a very good clip to go to because that's a reminder of the era when the Fed declared victory on inflation too soon mm -hmm. and then had to go back and, and raise rates again. And for us, that's the biggest risk that that happens again. We're looking at a number of things. I think the one most recently that's occurred is China is reopening. And suddenly you're going to have a billion for consumers out there consuming. That's twice the size of the U.S. and Europe put together. That could create a lot of pressure on the price of goods and services. The other thing out there that we're very mindful of is that the U.S. and Europe got away with a very mild winter, and that kept energy prices low, as did releasing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. What happens when we get into the summer and perhaps 
everyone's driving around, you've got to cool places, you're using a lot more energy, and the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is being rebuilt. That could put a lot of upward pressure on inflation. So, Aaron, what about those are two very interesting risks. One of them is that, that inflation is not going away, the Fed will actually have to keep raising, or after pausing, have to raise again, maybe because of China. How big a risk is China in terms of inflation? I think that China, with respect to global inflation and particularly developed market inflation, is actually going to be quite small. The, the way that we think about it from a growth perspective, it probably has about a 0.2 percentage point increase to U.S. growth and maybe 0.3 percent increase to European growth just because of the trade effects. And pretty similar impact to inflation, albeit potentially even a little bit smaller than those impacts. And that's because, you know, typically in an environment where you see China growth really rebounding, those tend to be the typical effects to growth and inflation to global developed market GDP and inflation. This time around, it could be even a little bit smaller given the fact that the reflation story and the, and the growth story in China is going to be really centered in domestic growth drivers and more service reopening drivers rather than what you typically see, which tends to be more investment and infrastructure led. So this time it's going to be really focused on travel, getting back to work, getting back to, you know, typical service oriented economy, which is very domestic China focused. It probably has a bigger impact into the region than the you know, region and sort of the countries closest to China rather than to the U.S. and into Europe and to more developed market economies um, in the Western world. And so I think that the effects are going to be good for, for China, good for maybe Korea, for Thailand, to Singapore, to Hong Kong, but, but not as strong as a driver for growth and inflation you know, in the U.S. or in Europe. Although we did see the price of copper shoot up pretty smartly once China started to reopen. So they're out there competing for the re same resources that the Western world is now. That's inflationary pressure. Bob, what about more broadly? Uh, to what extent oh. do you take into account emerging markets in your decisions about bond investing? We're going to have Rashir Sharma on in a few minutes here talking about India. Is that a factor in making investment decisions, Bob? It's, it's an enormous factor as we look across bond markets. We've been very impressed with the emerging markets. We like to track the cumulative number of rate hikes since the start of 2021. The developed markets have done close to 4,000 basis points. The emerging markets have done over 22,000 wow. basis points of rate hikes. They got in front of this. They raised rates. Real yields are high. They slayed, slowed growth and inflationary pressures. We can go into those markets, get high real yields, and you know what? We do think the dollar has topped. It will come down over the balance of the year. That's a pretty nice tailwind to local emerging market debt. Aaron, I think I cut you off. No, what I was going to say was the biggest driver for inflation, particularly in the U.S., from a commodity perspective, tends to be energy. And we've seen, even since the China reopening, which started in early, in early October, we've seen energy prices come down you know, fairly significantly, and gas prices also fall pretty precipitously as well. So while typically you would think that if it was going to have a significant commodity impact from China reopening, you would see that occur in, in energy costs, we've actually seen the opposite occur, which is why I don't think, you know, just looking at the data and looking at what's transpired and looking at how China is reopening and the, the sectors that's going to be impacted, I, it's why I don't think you're going to see a huge, you know, sort of impact to inflation from China reopening. Uh, I hope that's right. I hope the Fed engineers a soft landing. But China is going to be out there consuming and spending. And we also have to look at Europe. Europe did not go through the pain that we all feared over the last several months. That's put them in a much better position to consume as well. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you so very much. It's great to have both of you back with us. It's always a treat. That is Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan and also Aaron Brown of PIMCO. Coming up, hedge funds met in Miami this week. They call it Hedge Fund Week, actually. We're getting a report from Shanali Basak about exactly why an investor should have a place in their portfolio for the very speculative hedge funds. That's coming up next, and we are on Wall Street Week, and we are on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Well, this week was hedge fund week down in Miami, and our very own Shanali Basak went down to report on this really important event for hedge funds. We welcome her now to Wall Street Week. Great to have you, Shanali. Glad you were down there for it. So uh, talk to the smart long-term investor who's looking at their portfolio. Uh, why, do, why do I need hedge fund in my portfolio? I mean, it looks like some make money, some lose money. And, and as a whole, the industry has lost more than $200 billion last year. So it's not like the hedge funds at large are doing so well. But there are a select few that have had some of their best years in history. Take Citadel, for example, which not only had $16 billion in profit last year, they surpassed John Paulson with the greatest trades ever. Uh, and so single trades as well as uh, larger funds have had amazing years. But what strategy, I think, is what you're asking here? What What is a hedge fund? I want to take a listen here really quickly to Nassim Taleb, the black swan author who is famous for navigating these types of events. Because even in 2022, Universa, the fund that he advises, didn't have a favorable year. But this is what's ahead as what he has to say. We have more debt than we ever did in history. We have the weirdest valuations in history. And we have... Uh, a lot more connectivity than we did before. So add these things up and, and realize that, hey, you know what? Disneyland is over, the children go back to school, and then make sure you're home. So now we're gonna go back to the world. It's a humbling time, but listen, I spoke to both Taleb as well as Jim Chanos, for example, who expects that over time corporate profits could drop another 50 percent. And so whether you're going short in the market, like Jim Chanos is known for, or whether you're buying options, like Nassim Taleb, or whether you're Cliff Fastness and believe that trend following will get you there, there are a lot of strategies that are coming back to the surface now. And at a humbling time, as you call it, we have a new leader at the top of the largest head fund, a new co-CIO for Bridgewater. Tell us about her. Yeah, it, remember, Ray Dalio just stepped down from this post about four months ago, and he was co-CIO. But as he transitions, remember, there are two new CEOs as well at Bridgewater that started early last year, and this is their new leadership team. This is the big change. It comes at a tough time, David, because remember, I was talking about Citadel. You have Citadel surpassing Bridgewater as the highest grossing hedge fund firm of all time, according to LCH Investments. So Karen Carniel tambor will take them into this new generation. She's only 37 years old, but started her career there being recruited there by Greg Jensen. Uh, I spoke to her a little bit about her view and how they're navigating this market cycle. This is what she had to say. I think the Fed could tell dovish in the near term relative to what's priced in, but it's very, very short lived because at the end of the day, when you look at the basics of what's ahead of them, the Fed is going to face tough trade-offs. Over any kind of medium time frame, you're going to either have the economy slowing a lot more than is currently expected by markets, there's basically no earnings slowdown that's expected whatsoever, or the Fed is going to see that they have to go back to tightening because they're not getting the inflation that they want. So much of that is in line with what I was telling you about this kind of negative view that you had from a lot of these hedge fund firms. Now, whether she's right or not, that will really set up for this year, for Bridgewater, the success of this new team and the competition they're facing across the industry. As you say, a humbling time to take over the job. Thank you so much to Shali Basak, who reports on all things Wall Street right here for Wall Street Week. Coming up, it's the country with the largest population in the world and the fifth largest economy. We talk with Ashir Sharma of Rockefeller International about whether investors should be taking a fresh look at India. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. India, the fifth largest economy in the world, with more people than China, and as the head of the State Bank of India told us in Davos, it's growing faster. We are quite hopeful that this year we'll witness a growth of about 7%. And going forward, even next year also on the higher base, we expect the growth to be about 6%. India is benefiting from supply chain concerns with China. For too long, countries around the world have been overly dependent on risky countries or a single source for critical inputs. But we're proactively deepening economic integration with trusted trading partners like India. And it's moving fast on everything from electric vehicles, from companies like Tata. I think the EV transition in India is coming through very strong and very fast, much, much faster than what people are expecting it to be. 
to the expansion of 5G. Our objective is by March 24 to cover the entire country on 5G. All of which is leading investors like Steve Ratner of Willett Advisors to take another look at opportunities in India. It does feel at the moment like India really is starting to uh, move forward for a whole variety of reasons, including China moving back. And so India is interesting on a number of levels. And to bring us up to speed on where India is today and where it may be going for investors, welcome to somebody who knows the country terribly well. He is Rushir Sharma. He is the chairman of Rockefeller International, also founder of Breakout Capital. Rushir, great to have you back on Wall Street Week. I mean, I hear a lot of talk about maybe India is the next China in, in, in terms of investment here, the next great opportunity. Wh how, what's your reaction to that thought? Well, David, um, I guess this is a legacy of the fact that I've covered India now for nearly three decades. Uh, and my consistent observation about India has been that this is a country that has consistently disappointed the optimists and the pessimists. So this is not the first time that I've heard India being the next China. India will be India, which is that it's a complicated story. There are many nuances out here, and there will possibly never be a next China, uh, just because what China achieved over its uh, four-decade-long economic expansion, where it grew at a pace uh, of uh, nearly 10%, I think is something which we have never seen in history and we're unlikely to see ever again because an extraordinary set of circumstances and leaders brought China to the position it is. And as you know, that China has been reversing many of its policies over the last few years. Uh, so as far as India is concerned, I think that it uh, offers many great prospects, uh, but to project China on it is a story I've seen in the past. And unfortunately, I feel uh, that people who think that are likely to be a bit disappointed. Rashir, as you so wisely suggest, you really can't compare any two countries. Uh, at the same time, is there one parallel? Part of the reason for the amazing economic progress of China is they started from a very low base. Uh, and you actually caused me to go back and look at per capita uh, GDP for India, and it's something like $2,500 a year, as opposed to China, which is like five times that much. Does that offer actually an opportunity? Because there's a lot of headroom there. You can grow an awful lot. Yes. So I think that India, in terms of because of its low base, will remain one of the fastest growing economies on the, in the world. It's been so um, over the last three or four decades, just that its success uh, has been overshadowed by what China has been able to achieve. But if you look at India's growth, it has consistently grown at a pace of about two and a half to three percentage points faster than the global economy. Uh, that's been the link. Uh, China's growth rate uh, during the similar income levels was far greater than the average of the global economy. India's average has been about two and a half to three percentage points faster than the global economy. It's consistently been that. And there's nothing to suggest that that's about to change. So if you expect the global economy to grow at about two, two and a half percent, which is what I expect it to for the foreseeable future, then I think that India's growth rate is likely to be five, five and a half percent or so. Anything more than that to expect out of India is far too ambitious and something we have never seen uh, in its uh, post-reform history, which began in 1991. Rushir, could the role of the government actually modify that? Because it's long been perceived that in India, the government has had a very active role, can I put it that way, in the economy, uh, and has not really backed off. Is there a potential for the Modi government really to back off a little bit and to let it go? You wrote a fascinating piece in the Financial Times last summer, actually, on the 75th anniversary, saying the problem with India is it got to political freedom before it got to economic freedom. Are we moving toward economic freedom? Well, even there, I think that, the, uh, as is the case with most things in India, the story is a bit more nuanced. So at one level, the Modi government has been doing the right things, which is cutting taxes, uh, 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 following a pretty responsible fiscal and monetary policy mix, um, and it desisted from doing too much stimulus. The problem is that we still haven't seen private investment or manufacturing really pick up in a meaningful way. As you know, the key to success of China and other East Asian countries was you got a manufacturing boom and really uh, exporting your way to prosperity is the only path to achieving very rapid income. The issue in India, and I think that this goes back even to the current government is that the government is far too involved in people's lives. And one of the issues with the Modi government, I think, is that the regulatory overreach remains a lot, which is that a lot of business people in India uh, remain in the sphere that whether it's the tax authorities, whether it's the 
investigation uh, uh, people that somebody is going to always come knocking on your door. Uh, and often it is for vindictive reasons uh, or extortion reasons. That culture is still very pervasive in India. And in fact, it may have even uh, been aggravated in the last few years that this perception was created that a lot of Indian businesses are crooks and they need to be reined in. And some of it is just personal political vendetta. So I think that that is one of the big issues in India, which is that the government at, on one hand is trying to encourage more private investment, trying to come up with more schemes, more incentive schemes uh, to help with that. Uh, schemes is what they call it. Uh, I know it has a different connotation here, but also cutting taxes uh, and being responsible from a fiscal side. But the, on the other hand is this uh, climate of fear created by the regulatory overreach, which I think is holding back some of the investment uh, and also ends up being quite intimidating to even foreign investors. Uh, when we talk about investment in India right now, given what's going on in the news, we think about the Adani companies. And I don't know what's going on. I suspect you don't know what's going on. So this is not about the merits of exactly what the claims are about the Adani companies. But does it raise questions in Western investors' minds with respect to India about how predictable and reliable the system is to make large investments? Yeah, so this has been a problem with emerging markets, as you know, in general. But having said that, as far as India is concerned, um, just going back to my original statement that everything you say about India, the exact opposite is also true. Uh, so yeah, India has had a series of uh, such issues uh, in the past as well. But what I'll highlight about India is this, that when I look at the investment universe, the highest number of really high quality companies is also to be found in India. How do I define high quality? You look at return on equity, uh, look at the consistent earnings growth, or just the sheer number of stocks in India that have gone up four or five times in dollar terms over the last decade is possibly the highest, at least as a ratio of the overall market, is the highest of any country I know in the world. So yeah, we keep getting these kind of issues that come to the fore, but the other side of the equation is that some of the highest quality companies in the world, including uh, the US uh, for that matter, at least as a ratio of the overall total, um, you, you get some of the highest quality companies in India. Now, the problem is that they're also valued that way. Uh, if you look at the 100 largest companies in India, about a third of them trade at a price to earnings multiple uh, of nearly 40. Uh, so that is a staggering number. I think that is really what the fundamental issue today in India is, that it got a bit overhyped. It is the most expensive market in the world if you look at traditional valuation metrics. And I think that uh, we're seeing a bit of disappointment, a bit of that bloom come off the rose uh, because of uh, these uh, very high expectations and this hype about India being the next China being reflected in the prices in the market. Yeah, such an important point. It's not just a question of the quality of the company, but also what price are you buying the company at? Is the, are the other investors already in, so it's too expensive? Thank you so much, Rashir. It's always great to have you with us on Wall Street Week. That's Rashir Sharma. He is chairman of Rockefeller International. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We are joined once again by our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, I got to start with those jobs numbers out on Friday. When they crossed, I actually thought maybe they were wrong. This is extraordinary. 517,000 jobs we're adding, given where we are already. It's a huge miss relative to the consensus. It's way out of line with what you'd have expected with uh, ADP. The labor market's running very differently than lots of other indicators uh, in the economy, where you see some signs, particularly in manufacturing, of real slowing. So it's a pretty confused uh, picture. Uh, one idea would be that people are still worried about how much work they're going to get out of their workforces, given people uh, working at home, given increased absenteeism, given a variety of uh, post-COVID changes. And so 
They just feel that whenever they can get workers, they should take the opportunity. But it sure does seem like we have a lot of workers relative to the amount of demand we have or amount of production we have in uh, the economy. And the question is, is all this going to be income that's going to be spent, that's going to lift the economy up uh, a bunch? Is it going to turn out that at some point people realize they've got too much inventory and labor and we're going to see a fairly sudden stop? I think it's as difficult an economy to read as I can uh, remember. Uh, a year ago at this time, I was pretty confident about what the principal imbalances were and how things were going to play out. I don't have that kind of confidence right now. Can we have this sort of addition to the job market and not have wages go up more than we thought? They went up 4.4 percent. This is year over year now um, on the monthly, which was a tenth of a percent more than expected. But it wasn't that dramatic. Uh, are we going to have wage inflation kick in here that will really give us problems once again on monetary policy? David, that's a basic question. I went back and looked at the forecasting model emphasizing vacancies that I had used a year ago to predict that we were headed for significant wage inflation problems. And what I found was quite interesting to me. What I found was that that model is predicting wage inflation right now just about right. But it substantially underpredicted wage inflation in the latter part of 2022. So we saw an acceleration beyond what models would have predicted that uh, in 2022. We saw that, I now realize, with respect to wages, just as we saw that with respect to prices. And the central question is, we had some easy come, and now it's come off very quickly, inflation. And the question now is whether that inflation is going to continue to decline rapidly, continuing the trend of the last few months, or whether the inflation that was never really predicted by models was, in a sense, ultimately transitory. But now we're left with an underlying inflation that's going to be much more difficult to have get out of the economy. And if the latter is the case, we're going to have a more difficult uh, set of challenges in achieving the proverbial soft landing. If the former is the case, uh, then there may be a more natural glide path to a soft landing. And I think it's very difficult uh, to know. So it's really a question about whether there's two categories of inflation easy come, easy go inflation and underlying base inflation, or whether we can infer a lot from the progress of the last few months. And that's something that I think one has to remain agnostic about. And the difficulties you described, Larry, uh, sit right on the desk of Jay Powell, the chair of the Fed, from whom we heard, of course, this week in connection with their decision. Last week, before we heard from him, you were on this program saying it's what the Fed has is sort of like a car on a foggy night, and basically you got to keep the foot close to the accelerator and close to the brake. And this is actually what your friend and colleague Paul Krugman had to say, reacting to what you had to say. It this really disturbs me to say this, but I think I agree with Larry. Yeah, we, we could... You know, we will get it wrong one way or the other, and uh, there's a reasonable chance in either direction. So, Larry, you disturbed your friend Paul Krugman because he actually agreed with you. But at the same time, do you think Paul did exactly what you were describing? Did he keep his foot sort of close to both the brick and the accelerator without going too far either direction? I think the Fed's doing a good job of portraying substantial uncertainty uh, in uh, the economy recognizing that it's going to be very hard and one's going to have to try to interpret the data month by month and that there are a lot of uh, surprises. I think they're having a difficult time uh, convincing markets 
on uh, their determination and with respect to the path towards the end of uh, the, the year. I probably still think uh, the risks that the two-part theory I just laid out is true and that the inflation reductions will be uh, transitory. I think that risk is greater than I think the Fed uh, thinks it is. I do still think there is the risk uh, that I've talked about earlier on the show of a kind of wily e. coyote moment where firms realize they've got too much uh, inventory and uh, too many, uh, too many people, and that you see a more economy-wide turn to adjustment of the kind you've seen in the relatively uh, limited, in terms of employment, technology sector. But that's not, that's certainly anything but a confident uh, prediction. Uh, Larry, let's turn from the central bank, actually the executive branch, and the White House, where there's a big change going on uh, in the staff there. Ron Klain, the chief of staff, has left. Also, Brian Deese, with whom you, I know you've worked personally very closely. What do you think about their tenure? And as important, what does President Biden now need going forward? I think uh, Ron Klain as chief of staff and Brian Deese as head of the NEC have uh, very proud legacies they can look back on. This administration, with a very small set of margins in the Senate and in the, and in the House, probably passed more economic legislation in its first two years than any administration in more than two generations. There are, to be sure, real and serious issues with inflation, but I don't think anybody would have predicted an economy quite as strong as the one in the labor market, at least, uh, that we are seeing, uh, that, we're, that we're seeing right now. So they've got an enormous amount to be uh, proud of, as does uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen, who uh, will fortunately uh, be continuing uh, in her position and will provide, I think, some hugely important uh, stability for the, for the economy. But Ron Klain and Brian Deese should be and are leaving with their heads held uh, very high. And of course, one has to give enormous uh, credit to the president who relied on them to really push forward a set of uh, very bold uh, policies. And finally, Larry, give us a minute on antitrust. We've talked in the past about Lena Kahn, the chair of the FTC, and her new approach to antitrust. She tried it out in court, trying to stop, actually, Meta from making an acquisition of a small virtual reality startup uh, and was rebuffed by the court. What do you make of that? I'm worried about overambition in uh, antitrust uh, policy. This isn't the first or the second or the third time that uh, our antitrust authorities have lost in court for overstepping. I've heard stories that they are trying to ask so many questions about mergers, even when they don't think they're going to have a strong legal argument, the deadlines are passed and the mergers don't happen. That's not the way it should happen in a country that's uh, governed by the rule of law. Now, I don't know for sure whether those stories are true, but I think here at halftime in the administration, it'd be a good idea for the antitrust authorities uh, to step back and focus on their highest priorities, because I think there's the real risk that excess ambition will bring us the worst of all worlds. It will chill business uh, confidence. It will divert attention from cases that could be won. And it will discredit necessary uh, steps with respect to concentration. OK, thank you so very much to Larry Summers here, our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week.
Coming up, if at first you don't succeed, just keep doing it again and again. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Sometimes history doesn't just rhyme, it actually does repeat itself. This week, the U.S. celebrated Groundhog Day. That's when we all gather around to see whether Puxatawney Phil, that famous large Pennsylvania rodent, will or will not see his shadow, which, of course, determines how long winter will last for the rest of us. We do it every single year. I'm reliving the same day over and over. Just as we repeat other rituals, like, for example, when we regularly gathered to have the Fed chair tell us how inflation would go away on its own, until it didn't. Our expectation is that these, uh, these high inflation readings that we're seeing now will start to abate, and that's, that's what we think. There will be inflation, but that the process of inflation uh, will stop. It, in the end, it, it will be transitory, and uh, um, people need to have faith in the central bank. We also regularly gather to hear Mike Novogratz tell us that the rosy future for Bitcoin is just around the corner. Five years out, if Bitcoin's not at 500,000, I'm wrong on the adoption cycle. There's tremendous amount of venture capital that continues to come in this space. Five billion last quarter, nine billion the quarter before that. We've got all kinds of projects that we want for when the institutions come. Crypto will take off again. I think it gets to $100,000 or higher by the end of the year because I see all these new participants coming in. The world of sports is not without its own version of Groundhog Day, the special ritual when sports megastars announce their retirement, only to have to do it all over again when their retirement doesn't take. Like, for example, Michael Jordan. I am here to, to announce my retirement from the game of basketball. Uh, it won't be a, another announcement to baseball or anything to that nature. Or this week, of course, Tom Brady. I'll get to the point right away. I'm retiring. For good. But leave it to Congress to have a series of Groundhog Days even Hollywood would find too fantastic to put into a movie. As the House of Representatives last month voted for Speaker, again... A Speaker has not been elected. And again... A Speaker has not been elected. And again... A Speaker has not been elected. Leading one of our representatives, Republican Kat Kamek of Florida, to christen it officially. My colleagues, well, it's Groundhog Day, again. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.